Good afternoon, everybody. Happy to see so many of you connected throughout France and from different uh, towns and expert centers, I suppose, and probably future center, French mind centers. Uh, so we're very fortunate today to continue our uh, uh, path to, towards precision psychiatry with the voice of industry. I thought it was very important for us to give the floor uh, to a group extremely invested and implicated in the development of precision psychiatry. And we are very fortunate today to uh, have as a guest uh, Hugh Marston, who is speaking uh, from Germany. He is based in Biberach, close to Constance Lake, uh, which is uh, the, the heart of uh, industry and discovery at uh, Beringer. And Hugh is a neurobiologist specialist in psychopharmacology, and he's now senior vice president at Beringer Ingelheim. And he's also head of CNS discovery research at BI. So I think we can't listen to a better uh, person to help us understand the vision of industry towards what we're trying to create with the PEPR. Propsy and the French Minds cohort. So, Hugh, thank you very, very much to have uh, pre uh, prepared this talk for us and to have given us some of your time in a very, very, very busy schedule, I know. So, I, I give you the floor and we'll have time to for questions at the end. Thank you very much. Marion, many thanks for the kind invitation and to the Frontier Senior Fundamental for moving forward in this space. It certainly is an area that we are very keen to uh, encourage uh, movement in the right direction and something that we very much believe we need to do as a community in order to try and drive new treatments towards those that are suffering and living with mental health conditions. I'm going to try and share my screen. Um, Marion gave me the title, Why is Industry Interested in Precision Psychiatry? Um, and if I would just like to perhaps amend that slightly, I, what I'd like to really talk about today is why is industry engaged in precision psychiatry? As I believe we're not a, a square one on the game board. I think we have moved a few squares down the game board, but it's a very long game and we need many friends and collaborators and supporters uh, to move us down that, that path. Now, um, curiously, this, this slide was put together by uh, one of my, my colleagues. Um, and they didn't really ask me what the photograph was that they were going to put on this title slide for another talk I gave, but um, I was actually quite pleased that they did choose this because this, um, if for, for those of you, and I'm sure most of you online will, will know what it is, but this is what's referred to as a phrenology map. Um, now, the science or pseudoscience of phrenology was started by a gentleman called Franz Gahl, Franz Gahl back in 1796, actually a German psychiatrist. Um, but if you actually look at the history of phrenology, even back in the 1920s, so barely 100 years ago, a lot of patients were actually diagnosed in terms of what mental health condition they did through a phrenological examination. So really just looking at the bumps and lumps in somebody's skull and trying to define what their mental health status was by those bumps and lumps. So I think we really need to give ourselves a lot of credit that in the last hundred years, we've moved an incredible distance in the understanding of psychiatric and mental health conditions. But there are also major hurdles and major problems. And this is where I want to just, again, I'm afraid, cover a little bit of history. I hope all of you will know most of what I've got on this slide, but it will help perhaps explain the, the perspective that industry is coming at this issue from. So if we think about the psychopharmacopoeia that is available to psychiatry at the moment, it's actually quite a modern psychopharmacopoeia in one way, but also rather outdated and old fashioned in a second. So we know there has been lots going on in, in the mental health space. I just mentioned phrenology. If we think about galvanism that went on to ECT, that really only managed to make progress 
um, by the use of, of curare and other neuromuscular blocking agents um, that were popularized uh, initially uh, by James Lind back in uh, the early 1800s. And indeed, the way that we think about uh, mental health disorders comes significantly from uh, papers and discussions in the 1890s, early 1900s, as those conditions were codified with dementia praecox being one of the easier ones to identify, first mentioned by Benedict Morel in, 18, Morel in 1852 and then popularized by Crapelin in, in 1896. But you can see that there's about a 50 year gap between beginning to understand the biology perhaps of some aspects of uh, the mental health space and the codification of the mental health space and the first psychopharmacological agents that really are the ones that we use today to coming to the forefront. And this came out of some incredible um, chemistry, which actually was uh, led principally by, by teams in Paris, even during uh, the 1940s. And that led in uh, the 1950s um, for the first uh, neuroleptic or promazine to go to market, the first tricyclic antidepressant imipramine to go to market. And then in 1960, the first of the uh, antipsychotics haloperidol was licensed. And then very shortly after, we see uh, in the anxiety area, uh, diazepam, um, the most widely prescribed benzodiazepine was given its license. At the same time, you can see over on the left, um, DSM-1, which is the first version of the uh, digital statistical manual that we now use prim primarily to uh, codify mental health patients, um, was, was published. And that's run through uh, to DSM-5, uh, which was released in 2013 um, and is currently perhaps being due for update to DSM-6, we would assume, in the next few years. But beyond those 1960s, clearly there was refinement, um, but not, not dramatic refinement. In 1987, fluoxetine, the first SSRI, um, came out. Um, it's, it's a better pharmacology than the, than the tricyclics, but in terms of uh, pharmacology, it's not, not very, very different. And indeed, most of the SSRI, SNRI family are chemically really quite similar. Likewise, clearly moved on from haloperidol and the atypicals came out in the 1990s with alanzapine, risperidone and quetiapine. But even that is now getting on for nearly 30 years ago since we made a major breakthrough in the psychopharmacology available to mental health professionals with the help of those suffering from mental health conditions. We're very pleased that S-ketamine has been moved forward by, by Janssen, one of our uh, competitor companies. But even there, if you think about the pharmacology of S-ketamine, that goes back uh, into the 1940s, 1950s, uh, where ketamine first came out as a, as a horse tranquilizer and, and used in anesthesia. So again, the chemistry hasn't moved on very far forward. So I have to be very honest as a representative of psychopharmacology and industry that really we haven't done anything very innovative probably for the better part of 50 years. And if we're being kind, 30 years. So how do we shift that? How do we change that? What barriers do we need to overcome in order to move forward? Clearly, mental health is still a major issue. Again, a lot of these numbers would be ones that you are aware of, that we probably have got somewhere in the region of 800 million people worldwide, about just over 10% of the, the planet's population are affected in some way by mental health disorder. If we look at the load on the effectively the, the, the world um, econ economy, it may, uh, depending on how you measure it, take up to about 4% of most nations' GDPs. Um, we don't have very many breakthroughs. Many areas remain untreated or at best partially treated. And we still have a diagnostic framework that was first developed in the 1890s. But there is, I think, very nice evidence that there is light at the end of the tunnel. We are um, moving forward in the scientific space very, very rapidly. We're moving forward in the medical and the technical space very rapidly. And indeed, the fact that you guys are meeting together under the auspices of the fundamental uh, Fondationale fundamental is really great evidence that these sorts of things are moving forward and that there is an awful lot of rethinking going on at the moment. 
Um, Marion and I just had a catch up chat and it's really quite amazing that if we'd had that chat two, three years ago, it would have been quite difficult to identify um, forums, meetings, initiatives that are moving forward in this space. And now it probably takes Marion and I half an hour to just list all the various different meetings and workshops and committees that are moving forward. So that's really good. I would love to have the mental health space all to my own with Boehringer being the only company playing new games in this space. Um, but on the other hand, it is a difficult area to change and competition is always good. So we're keen to uh, see that other pharma are coming back in and actually just over the uh, Christmas holidays and early into January, it's been very interesting to see that the biggest deals done in the pharma world are those actually in the mental health space with Abvi buying Cerebel, uh, principally for their uh, muscarinic pipeline, um, BMS buying Karuna Therapeutics uh, for Car XT, again, a muscarinic approach. But if you look at those numbers, these are uh, in the billions of dollars. So clearly people do feel that there is potential uh, to move the uh, needle in the pharmacology associated with mental health. So just to give you a little bit more background on our perception of, of what's good and what's not so good. Um, at the moment, I would think it would be fair to say that most diagnosis occurs uh, in a clinical setting in face-to-face -face meetings. Those diagnoses are within the framework of a, a DSM-5 or ICD-10 framework, but this really is one that, that hasn't moved on, in my opinion, uh, for a good while. Reassessment of the patient occurs periodically, probably at best at weeks, more likely months, or at a moment of crisis. Many patients, when we look at the numbers, really don't receive very much treatment. There are many uh, disorders for which the, the, there is no treatment or the treatment is actually delayed because of the side effects. And many of these treatments either take months to become available due to supply issues or actually take months to actually become effective. So clearly there is much we can do to improve that. We're also suffering from a really major issue in industry that when we carry out clinical trials, it's very, very difficult for us to get a, a robust statistical signal that the uh, new treatment actually is beneficial to the patient. The placebo effect, or what is now often more accurately referred to as the, the non-specific clinical trials benefit, is really crippling the way that we move these projects forward. And that's because the clinical trials themselves almost appear to be clinically efficacious in their own right. So what do we need to change? How can we change it in a way that we hope to move what uh, is a phrase I'll try and explain and give more detail to in a transdiagnostic mental health space in the future. We think I think we could safely say we're on a, a path that's going to take us decades to complete, but this maybe give you some idea of, of the industry perspective of actually how we go about operationalized, move, operationalizing moving down that path. Clearly, we're starting from the known statement that DSM is the, the primary way that we diagnose patients. But from my perspective, those patients land up in groups that are heterogeneous with respect to the biological issues that those individuals um, suffer from. If you may remember back to my second or third slide, at the point where DSM-5 was published, there was also coming out from the NIMH, authored by Tom Insull and Bruce Cuthbert, the RDOC framework. Now, the RDOC was really trying to put into, uh, into detail ways that we may be able to start thinking about mental health patients at a more biological level in an, in an attempt to begin to move us forward beyond the conceptualization that was in DSM. Now, that provides an understanding of domains and basic structures and processes that are going on in the brain. Well, that then leads us actually more specifically to circuits and systems. And these are things that um, within industry where I'm principally working from a pharmacological perspective, I need to find ways that we can target things, receptors, ion channels, um, biology of different cell types, these sorts of things. We need to work out how these are going and that then gives us the targets against which we can uh, drive these projects forward. 
But what we need to be able to do is join the biology up with the patient. So we land up rationally delivering to the right patient, the right therapeutic at the right time. That's what I hope over the next uh, little while I can explain a little bit more about how we're doing that. Now, the, there is an issue um, in research and development, uh, as well as in the medical world, that to a certain extent, if you've got an existing diagnostic framework, from that diagnostic framework, there will come the scales, tools, and endpoints that are used in everyday medical practice. They, in turn, because they are the accepted and qualified tools, become the endpoints for clinical studies, um, clinical trials, all these sorts of things. And to a certain extent, you land up with a self-fulfilling prophecy that if you've got scales and tools and endpoints, and you're looking at new approaches that are designed to work against those scales, tools, and endpoints, they will tend to fit within the existing diagnostic framework. Now, this is extremely efficient if you've got, let's say you've just developed um, the first SSRI, and you're now looking to develop the second SSRI, you can use this framework to say, well, the first SSRI worked on scale X using tool Y and give us, give, gave us clinical endpoint Z. Therefore, if I'm going to come up with a molecule that's slightly better, maybe it's got less side effects or maybe it works more quickly, I've got a framework that I can work within. And that enables you to refine the approach you have there but it doesn't often offer a way of breaking out of that network into a new space so how do we move out of the constraints and facilitate well we need new disease concepts we probably need new scales tools and endpoints and these in turn might actually give us new insights that enable us to develop new studies and hypotheses at the same time we need to in industry be looking at the balance between the biological and chemical risk. Some targets are extremely difficult to develop chemistry against um, for various reasons that I don't have time to go into today. Others, the biological side may be extremely difficult. But likewise, if we're moving into new space, there may also be clinical risk, that if we've come up with a new concept that isn't widely accepted within the clinical community and that aren't validated or qualified endpoints, even though the chemistry may be superb and the biology may be superb, moving that through the clinical trials process and then into clinical practice may itself be risky. So we need to balance all of these things off. So to give you an idea of how this actually turns into real things, if we think about DSM-5 and ICD-10, this to a certain extent has helped various parameters to be defined. So you've got the PANS positive symptoms, for example, you've got the MADRAS looking at depressive aspects, and you've got the ADAS-COG, which is used in dementia to, to measure cognitive, com uh, cognitive compliance. And that in turn means that you're able to quantify the effect of a neuroleptic or an SSRI or an anticholinesterase inhibitor. But if we want to move into this new space over here, where perhaps just as an example, you might want to manipulate glutamate dysfunction in a very specific way. What are the school scales and tools you're going to use in order to measure the change that you've been able to achieve using that glutamate uh, change? Indeed, how do you find the patient who has that particular glutamate dysfunction that your new approach is going to work on? And in fairly late phase at the moment, we've uh, got acylpertin, which is a GLI-T1 uh, molecule, and uh, just recently announced we've got a, an NR2B NAM program. These are ones where we're looking to explore how we develop new tools and endpoints so that we can begin to move into a new space. And I'll tell you a little bit more about these molecules later on, um, and I'm very happy to ask questions about them. As a consequence of trying to do this, we've now tried to set up a slightly different structure within Boehringer as to how we deal with information. Historically, most drugs are developed in a rather linear fashion, that uh, a scientist will come up with a concept of what they think a, a new molecule might be able to do. Um, that tends to go into an animal model or an in vitro model. It shows effect in that. That is then passed to early clinical studies. And from early clinical studies, you go to late clinical studies and you go to market. Now, that's where you understand the biology. 
So if, for instance, I was working in the onco oncological space, um, some recent papers have come out saying a particular genetic manipulation or per perturbation in certain patients uh, was causing a problem. So going back a long time, the first time that HER2 was, for instance, identified as a, as a genetic association in a number of cancers, that then immediately gives you um, a biological starting point to start this linear approach. Mental health, we're in a much more difficult space. We're often needing to understand the patient better. And that's really why I put the phrenology there on that first slide is actually what we need to do is understand the patient properly. We don't need just to look at the bumps and lumps on the skull. We actually really need to know what's going on biologically inside the brain. And it's really only recently that we've been able to do that in any detail. And that then enables us to back translate from the understanding of the human, like HER2 was back translated into the oncology space, and we can then move on. But we probably need to go through series of iterative refinement in order to make this uh, a new dawn for psychotherapeutics. To give you an example of the sorts of initiatives that have been ongoing for a while, I've been very lucky to lead uh, an IMI program in collaboration with my uh, good friend and colleague, Martin Cass in the University of Groningen, um, where we've been trying to actually think about um, social dysfunction as an area within the mental health space that is probably not particularly well understood at a biological level. So PRISM is a program now which is in its second phase. We're, we're actually nearly 10 years into this study of trying to understand whether social dysfunction that at a face valid level looks very similar if you are a, um, a Alzheimer's patient or a schizophrenic patient or a major depressive patient, your ability to interact with society looks similar. But is that driven by the same biology or because you've got different disease uh, agents available in there, are you actually working with completely different biologies? Or are the biologies that transcend those uh, treatment classifications and actually offer a new way of thinking about the individual. And that's really what PRISM is trying to drive at. And I believe you've got Martine speaking later in the sequence. So rather than go in depth into the findings of PRISM, that's just giving you an example of things that have been ongoing, uh, funded and supported and driven by industry for over 10 years. But I do want to give you one example um, here um, that getting the new tools and measures actually um, qualified by the uh, regulatory agencies is not a trivial job. Um, and there are many uh, moving forward and hopefully as we uh, carve out a path, then uh, other ones can follow. Um, but within the PRISM study, we were using a uh, app that was developed at the University of Utrecht and is now based at the University of Groningen, which sits inside your mobile phone and gives us lots of information anonymized in terms of the social interaction that the phone is measuring. So what's your GPS location? What, how many are you making outgoing calls? Are you making ingoing calls, et cetera? And what we were able to demonstrate within PRISM was actually using the data from the app, we can get a much more accurate um, understanding uh, and unbiased understanding of the social um, behavior of an individual patient or even a healthy control. And those classifications uh, really did seem to make some sense. But to our surprise and somewhat uh, relief, when we actually looked at these, we found that the alignment between the different phenotypes that we were able to use uh, as a consequence of this very data rich space, those phenotypes did not align with the traditional um, DSM diagnoses. So over here, uh, where you can see these bar charts, there are actually three uh, clinical or three phenotypes emerge, cluster one, cluster two, cluster three. And if I had more time, I could explain what actually those different clusters look like. And I think you would find it very easy to recognize the uh, behavioral profiles that are there. But what was interesting is that in the first cluster, uh, we actually do have quite a lot of healthy controls as well as schizophrenics. And indeed, there are a few Alzheimer's patients. In the, in the middle cluster, there are rather more ADs, but again, there are still a lot of healthy controls. Um, there are a few schizophrenics. And then the third cluster, we've got a fairly even spread across the different diagnoses. Now, each one of those clusters are, are, are different. 
Um, we actually now have got good biological correlates with different uh, structures within the brain that predict whether you fall into one, two or three. And we're even now identifying specific targets that would enable us to help maybe um, the individuals that are in one, two and three. But the point I really wanted to make on this slide is that without going to EMA, the European Medicines Agency, and gaining qualification of BAP or anything else of a similar nature, we as an industry sponsor of a clinical trial cannot use that data to support the registration of a molecule for a new reason. So it's extremely important that we actually not just use these tools in research, but we then go the extra mile and take them to the regulators and get them qualified as endpoints. And this is a long process. Um, as I said, this, this program started over 10 years ago, and it's only in June 2023 that with uh, my colleagues in Boehringer Medical Affairs um, and Regulatory, where we able to uh, assist uh, Groningen in their submission to EMA for this new, new endpoint. So I want to do a little bit of a deep dive into one particular area to just give you an idea of how we're trying to think about how uh, working in a precise way may enable us to understand schizo um, psychiatry better. And I'm gonna pick uh, schizophrenia as my exemplar. And this is just some background data on uh, the impact of schizophrenia on the planet and individuals. And you can see, and I won't go through any great detail, um, but it, it's clearly comorbid with other disorders. Um, we do have a significant issue that um, there is suicidality in the schizophrenic space. Um, a lot of people say that people don't die from, from psychiatric disorders, but that's patently wrong on many, many occasions, um, though it may not be as a direct consequence, it is an issue. And therefore, not only does it cause huge uh, load on the individual in terms of the everyday living uh, it makes a significant impact on caregivers on social structure um, socioeconomic burden but it actually can be uh, a, a very very serious condition in its own right and indeed the the prognosis in schizophrenia is absolutely pretty mathematically dreadful um, it's very very poor prognosis um, people at best are probably controlled um, maybe not controlled in the state that they want to be controlled in. And I don't think there is really very uh, much evidence that we ever get full remission of symptomatology. So what is schizophrenia? Well, we probably still don't know what schizophrenia really is at a biological level. Um, but so far, what we've been able to do very much uh, is focused on the positive symptoms. Those are the ones that are most obvious. They're the ones that make uh, an individual um, dangerous to themselves, but often as equally important, dangerous to those amongst themselves, uh, amongst others. And it's those that uh, usually uh, are used as the, the tipping point from somebody who may be in the program to the, somebody who's actually given the formal diagnosis of schizophrenia. Now, the uh, antipsychotics are fairly good at uh, both dealing with an acute uh, exacerbation in the positive space, but they're also fairly good at keeping somebody in a stable place uh, uh, moving forward. So they are invaluable um, in the acute scenario, and uh, they are able also to do something with respect to the suicidality. But what the antipsychotics don't do is address the other aspects which are illustrated on the uh, Venn diagram to the left, where we do have the positive symptoms, but they interact with the negative symptoms. And probably there is an underlying um, prodrome in the cognitive space. But certainly, even when you've been able to stabilize somebody on the positive symptoms, the ability for us to determine that these individuals um, have very high uh, incidence of cognitive dysfunction is very easy. So the antipsychotics don't improve the negative symptoms. They actually often impair cognitive function. They are associated with some really significant unwanted side effects, weight gain, metabolic dysfunction, extrapyramidal side effects. And actually, if we look at psychosis rather than schizophrenia, currently on the planet, there are more people suffering from psychosis as a consequence of dementia than they are of schizophrenia. And the antipsychotics, actually all of them are black box warned for the use in the elderly. So clearly we've got a disconnect between what we would like to have and what we do have in that space. 
But even if we take cognition, that is a big word that covers many, many aspects. And if we're going to really try and understand the biology of what's going on and then develop therapies to address that biology, we need to think about these things in a much, much more precise way than we have in the past. These are some of the um, cognitive domains that are routinely um, thought about within the cognitive neuropsychology space. So problem solving, speed of processing, working memory, social cognition, for instance. All of these things are things we probably understand how to measure them in a research way, but also we probably understand a little bit about what the fundamental biology is in the brain that drives some of these. But if we're going to develop um, approaches that deal with these, we will probably have to be fairly precise in understanding what the circuit is, but also in how we then manipulate that um, both behaviorally and at a pharmacological level. And indeed, if we think about cognition, cognition, even one of those small boxes on, on the previous slide where we identified seven areas, even then it gets more complex. So if we just think about this particular flow diagram here, time is a very important factor in our understanding of mental health conditions. So while you're awake, and hopefully most of you listen to me are awake, then you will be using systems that are sensory encoding the information. You'll be using subcortical areas to do secondary processing and putting weight and valence to those. And you'll need frontocortical systems to attend and ensure that you're listening and not being distracted in other areas. Information is then um, in many different ways process, but as an example here, we've got working memory, so information will go into the working memory, so maybe you'll be trying to remember things I've said so you can ask me a question in a few minutes' time. And to, though, those may be controlled by interfaces with the internal context, such as the limbic state. So if I say something that really stirs your emotions, that may have a stronger valence than something that doesn't. Your brain will then pick out certain bits of information within that working memory uh, space that you've collected over the, the active day and decide which bits of those are then going to be stored for long term processing and reference. And that's very much happening in the sleep phase and therefore consolidation in the cortex and hippocampus happens at a later time. And then clearly, in following days, months, and years, you may want to retrieve that information, which again, then uses another subset of circuits and systems that then link into also whether or not um, that particular behavior that is associated with that information was, uh, was reinforcing and something you want to do again, or actually led to negative outcomes that maybe want to be extinguished and removed from, from the system that you're using as your reference. So time is extremely important as we understand what's happening to the, to the individual. And if we look at time in a slightly different uh, time base, that was probably over 24 to 48 hours. But actually, a mental health condition, unlike a lot of other conditions, comes and goes in an incredibly fluid manner. There is a prodrome um, that builds up probably unseen in many cases over many years. There may be then a tipping point at which point a diagnosis occurs. But having been diagnosed, that individual will not remain static. There will be times when they have um, a bad period due to one particular set of events. Then they may recover. There may be another bad period, but it may be a completely different bad period. So if we're talking about schizophrenia, this might be a positive event of a, a series of positive symptomatology. And this might be a dense period of negative symptomatology, for instance. And then the patient recovers and moves on. So that natural history is incredibly important, but we also need to remember that a lot of these changes are happening not just at a daily or an Altradian level, but even down to a millisecond level. So if wherever you are at the moment, if the fire alarm goes off, you will suddenly switch your attention from listening to me to dealing with what you may need to do because you've now got that uh, signal that a fire alarm is uh, needing to be dealt with. And that will be very much dependent upon um, your mental state in terms of how you best perform that. So time is a very important factor. Why do I feel that actually we're in a good place that we actually may be able to shift some of the space here? We do have an awful lot of technologies which are now amenable and addressable at scale in the clinical space. And I'm very, very pleased that nearly all of these have got preclinical equivalents. 
and vice versa, there will be a few things that we've got in the preclinical space that we don't have in the clinical space, but there are not there are a, a reducing number of ways we can do that. Just to give you an example, because I do like to show a little bit of uh, breaking science, shall we say, one of the areas we're interested in is, is hippocampal function. And on the left, you can see a, a two photon image of hippocampal cells in a slice firing off spontaneously. Now, if you've got a, a patient who has a hyperactive hippocampus, and maybe that individual is then, as a consequence, um, uh, having delusions or a hallucination, maybe we want to damp down that firing in the hippocampus. And on the, on the right, you can see that in exactly the same brain slice uh, by using uh, a GP cell agonist uh, against a target that I'm afraid I can't disclose today, we've got a very, very nice uh, reduction in the firing. So we can see that in real time in a real biological construct. But more importantly, that sort of information is information that we can back translate from man to say that it was a hyperactive hippocampus that was driving that particular symptomatology, but also that enables us to route back to the clinic and the validation in clinical trials if we can demonstrate changes in hippocampal behavior. Therefore, just to give you a little bit more detail about how we're doing things at Boehringer, we are not going to have a crack at trying to do every single aspect of, of mental health. It is far too big. What we are trying to do, though, is focus down on systems and circuits that we feel we have some understanding on. So we're going to be focusing on cognitive function, emotion, particularly affected bias and rumination, impulsivity and motivation and reward and I'm very pleased to say that across all those four buckets uh, we have programs that are, are now in, in clinical development though not all of them have gone public in terms of their information. We also need to think about the road that we're moving along and this is really a lot of the things that we're discussing as a community now and I know uh, uh, Fondacino Fundamental is a key player in this space is, is how do we unblock the process, how do we move things forward, because we are in a world where DSM rules, we are in a diagnostic criteria led space. Um, but we do know that there are strong biologies behind some of those. And actually, at the moment, our phase three programs are probably being driven pretty much in the DSM space, but we're trying to fit the biology into that DSM space. That's not an ideal world, because if we look at the uh, little uh, icons at the top, if we feel we're treating a specific domain, within a particular uh, diagnostic bucket, um, let's say here we've got five individuals in a particular diagnostic bucket, there may only be two of them that actually have the biological problem that we are guessing is important in a subset of those individuals. Now, because at the moment we don't have any way of stratifying that patient population, we have to take all comers. But that then clearly reduces the power of the study. And indeed, I suspect there are many clinical trials, which if we'd been able to stratify, there really would have been statistical clinical benefit. But because the biology was very heterogeneous, we landed up with the wrong reason, the wrong answer for the wrong reasons. An intermediate approach, which we are now adopting in some of our early clinical programs, is where we do have a better handle on the biology and more importantly, how we measure the biology. So we still need to recruit patients based upon their DSM um, label. But what we can do then is try and enrich those groups of patients. So rather than only having two out of five with the biological problem, maybe we're moving more towards 75% of the patients in that particular bucket actually have the biological problem that we believe that the molecule will address. And then an example here that I will talk about a little bit more at the moment is we've got um, a couple of projects working in the impulsivity space and PTSD is uh, an area where we do see impulsivity in not all patients, but many, but we've now got ways that we can enrich that space, but we're still needing to use the DSM to find those individuals. What I very much hope is that in the future, we can move for what is now viewed really as a transdiagnostic approach. Because if you think about impulsivity, for instance, there is impulsivity in other mental health DSM criteria. And hopefully this biology would help all those that have that particular as aspect or type of impulsivity. And that's where we get to the term 
transdiagnostic, and that would enable clinical studies in that symptom domain to be objectively defined in those populations. But I really hope that eventually we can scratch out that word transdiagnostic and actually shift to a new uh, classification or ontology, which would then be a more precision psychiatry based approach that then enables us um, to actually think about impulsivity across psychiatric disorders, or maybe even somebody might have a much more biological label in terms of what that individual is uh, dysfunctional over, and maybe rather than saying somebody has um, major depression or psychosis, they actually ended up being referred to as somebody who has hyperglutamatergic hippocampal disorder, Myth moving it from the, the descriptive of the overt symptomatology to the descriptive of the dysfunctional biology. As an example of how we're trying to operationalize that, we have a program in phase two at the moment where we've got a molecule that targets the TRIPSI45 channel. Now, this actually is a nice example because the program here actually started from clinical data. And we know that um, in many cases, if you apply a stressor or a human uh, is exposed to stressful uh, activity, then we see that the amygdala lights up. Now, if you are in a stressful situation, having the amygdala light up isn't necessarily a bad thing. But the amygdala at some point will take control of your behavior and overrule the prefrontal cortex and you'll move from a, a cognitively controlled way of dealing with that stress to the fight and flight response that we're so familiar with. But if your amygdala is hyper reactive, the flip from the sensible thoughtful cognitive approach to that stressful scenario to the uncognate approach that is fight and flight may kick in far too early and that may be something that the individual would rather didn't happen in their life but if we back translate from that observation that if you give a stressor we can see the amygdala light up we know that the circuitry underlying that system is fairly well understood and we can back translate that into the animal and here we actually were using glutamate biosensors in that prefrontal amygdala circuit and we were able to demonstrate that if we stressed an animal using a very similar stressor to the one we used in the clinical studies gave the drug that we were able then able to reduce the glutamatergic signal that was seen in that circuit. And indeed, we then went back to exactly the same model that you saw in the bottom when we did our proof of clinical principle studies and were able to demonstrate that we could shift the activation state of the amygdala using that drug. And that's the data shown over on the right hand side. So if you actually really do start from the biology, you can complete that cycle. So what do we mean by precision psychiatry? What we want to do is increase precision at every step. We want to put the patient at the center, understand what their needs are. What is the biology driving the challenges they face? How do we measure and monitor that with time? Can we reverse translate and link that to symptoms and circuits? Can we develop a therapeutic against that maladaptive circuit? And then take advantage of the predefined biomarkers, which come from, from two and, and maybe even in one, enabling us to patient stratify. And that in turn allows us to forward translate to confirm proof of, uh, of novel clinical concept, confirm the real world benefit and the clinical benefit to take to market, facilitate the evolution of the ecosystem, the patients, carers, clinicians, payers, regulators, and industry. You can see an awful lot of stakeholders need to understand what you're doing. And that in turn will maximize the synergies between the pharmacological and the digital, which I'll touch on very briefly just in my closing slides, uh, but I don't have enough time to cover today. And as a consequence, we very much hope that working across that ecosystem, eventually we're able to deliver to the right patient, the right therapeutic at the right time. So to give you, going back to that Venn diagram of the schizophrenia, if we take the positive symptoms as controlled by the current state of um, standard of care, hopefully by uh, 2027, Boehringer will be in the position where we were able to be able to help with the cognitive dysfunction with our GLI-T1 inhibitor, Icopertin. We're developing the first prescription digital therapeutic in negative symptoms, which we hope, CT155, which we hope will then give uh, the physician the ability to address all the three principal areas. But we also want to ensure that the patient then fully integrates back into society. And there will be another digital approach there, CT156, which then brings all the three 
uh, components together into that real world benefit for the individual. So really rather switching the philosophy from a DSM driven approach that enables the physician uh, simplistically, I admit, to focus on which pill do you administer, which then hopefully treats the psychiatric condition to perhaps the other way around of actually thinking about mental health solutions. What combination of pill, digital support, human interventions do you need to land up precisely manipulating the dysfunctional processes that individual has. So pretty much finished, I think I've got maybe, uh, this is my, my penultimate slide. So on the, uh, the left are, I've recapitulated the, where we are, where I think we are at the moment. And then we can perhaps see where we might be in a precision psychiatry future. Hopefully we're in a place where disorders are diagnosed quantitatively and biologically using physiological and real world endpoints. We may very well be able to be uh, in a position to much more accurately stratify for study, but also in, in order to confirm the right uh, treatment package once things have reached market. We very much hope that uh, patients uh, assessed objectively and longitudinally and preferably out of the clinical uh, context and maybe this will be possible with new technology at home or in the real world. Um, we do really believe that these di digital technologies will allow continuous assessment of state and maybe be able to detect change of state and therefore why treatment may need to change. But it also will help us understand compliance, which is a major issue in the mental health space, and also offer us potential for, for non-pharmacological treatment, which certainly in the mental health space is a very, very powerful component in its own right. And taken together, these will increase the likelihood of success across our programs. And yes, this is written from a very mirroring perspective, but I very much mean our in terms of all of those working together to develop new approaches uh, in the mental health space, allowing innovative treatments to be brought to patients. So many thanks for your attention and very happy now to take questions on the story I've hope I've uh, elucidated a little bit today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hugh. That was a fantastic talk, a, a superb way to, to describe the avenue towards precision psychiatry. And it, it, seems, it seems really doable, which is rather an optimistic and nice uh, feeling. Uh, so thank you really very much. I just, while I wait for my colleagues to raise their hands or put questions on the chat, just have two questions. First, what do you see as uh, breaks uh, along this long avenue? Um, I, I tried to pick up on that a little bit on some other slides. Um, firstly, we need to understand the biology that an individual has. Um, and that may be a matter of developing hypotheses and these sorts of things. And I know that's an area that you, you, you and your colleagues, are, the, uh, the mental health space in, in France are working very heavily on amongst many other areas. If we're gonna understand the biology, then we need to develop the tools in order to measure them. Um, without the tools to measure what we really do think is wrong with the individual. We can neither categorize the individual, recruit the individual, or measure the benefit that something we've done to the individual is. So it's getting those measurement tools in place and validated and then qualified uh, with the regulators. Actually, probably the largest break, because I think a lot of us could come up with new hypotheses of what we think is going wrong in the mental health brain or mentally health mentally unhealthy brain, but actually really being able to robustly measure them and confirm those measurements is the one that I'm struggling with at the moment most. Second question while waiting for my colleagues. Uh, do, you th do, you, do you think in the future that we will keep these names for diagnosis and stratify within them? So will a patient come to a schizophrenic clinic, for example, and will identify several targets and circuits, but we still have, we'll keep these umbrella terms? My personal preference as a research scientist is no, because it would be much easier if somebody was labeled with a biological 
understanding of what was wrong with them. Have they got hippocampal glutamate dysfunction? Have they got prefrontal dopamine dysfunction? These sorts of things help me develop um, targeted and precise therapies in those spaces. But I also think it's actually very important for the patient themselves. A lot of stigma that is driven in the mental health space is actually driven from the nomenclature we're using. And actually, I think we've seen in the oncology space that as we've moved away from people suffering from cancer to people who are now suffering from cancer induced by a HER2 mutation, that's in some ways taken some of the stigma away from that. And if we could do the same in the mental health space, I think that will help the patient. I think it will help the carer. I think it will help the physicians. And it will also help me as a scientist try and design what we're trying to do. So I think that would happen, on, that would help in many different ways. And indeed, I don't know if you may or may not have noticed, but actually uh, in the recent issue of Nature, there's been a, a really nice uh, commentary by some oncologists who are now saying that maybe oncology services need to be reorganized. At the moment, they tend to have prostate cancer groups and breast cancer groups and brain cancer groups. And what they're beginning to do is reorganize oncology services into HER2 groups and um KRAS groups and things like this so you're 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 defining the way you think about the patient and the way you think about the treatment with respect to the biological problem rather than by the um, the structure or the uh, uh the part of the body that's suffering and I think that's a very logical way to go okay very optimistic at least within the French space, but I agree with you. Uh, we have a question from Bruno Wizarat in Bordeaux, uh, who says, a wonderful presentation and asks a question, which is, what is the impact of the compounds tested in rodents and humans in the field of PTSD and MDD on the glucocorticoid response to the acute stress hippocampal serotonin function? So very precise question. Very, very precise. Um, so that particular molecule um, is able to, uh, the, the glucocorticoid, uh, the um, corticosteroid uh, steroid effect in the rodents and, and the cortisol effect in humans um, does uh, map very nicely onto the changes in amygdala state. And there seems to be a threshold point where amygdala activation gets to a point at that point you're switching from a cognitive component to perhaps let's say a more stress driven component and at that point we then see the glucocorticoids change at that level so in that sense uh the, the molecules are able to let's say change the threshold in an individual system or circuit or an individual animal or an individual human. So the point at which the, the increases in corticosterone and cortisol occur are, are happening at a lower threshold. Um, in terms of serotonin function, um, I can't answer that question as clearly. Uh, we haven't mapped that out, particularly in the animals. We were, were more looking in the area of, uh, of the stress hormones and uh, also glutamatergic function because of the mechanism that we were looking in that space. But I would be surprised if we weren't able to see changes in serotonin, but I can't answer that specifically today. Thank you. Any question in the chat or? Among the group, listening. Veronique. Marion, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Hugh, for this very optimistic. Uh, I have an echo, sorry. Um, for this very optimistic thing um, and talk, I'm sorry. Uh, I think I have to remove my, my, my headset. Um, so I have a question about this optimistic view of yours. Uh, that if we if we channel the digital tools like BHAB, if we channel the biology, if we channel the clinical, uh, we're going to uh, to to achieve what we need for for patients. Uh, but in Prism, you already have all those tools. Do you do you have like a uh, um, a pilot study where you you could play, you could cross check all those tools in PRISM 2? Um, not in PRISM 2, no. Um, PRISM 2 was specifically designed to 
see if we could recapitulate the findings from PRISM 1 where we're looking in schizophrenia and in AD at the social dysfunction. And because we did get some very nice positive results in PRISM 1, PRISM 2 has tried to determine the reproducibility and robustness of those in those two patient populations, but then to see whether we can extrapolate that into the depressive space. And uh, there, the uh, clinical cohort that we were looking at, uh, we finished recruitment uh, just before Christmas, quite literally just before Christmas. So I'm talking to you now on the 7th of February, and we're, we're trying to work through the data at the moment. But certainly you're absolutely right, Veronique, that will be a very good PRISM 3, if there is such a thing. We've got to go and find lots of funding to do that, which is never easy. Um, but that, that's the sequence we need to do. If we've then got that new concept, you've got the endpoints, you've got the hypothesis, there are certainly uh, ways that I could imagine that we could intervene in that place. Um, and that's why we're going through the effort of trying to get EMA to, to qualify that particular endpoint along with other endpoints in that social dysfunction space. Yes, that would be the next step, would be to see if we can then manipulate that, that any of those parameters in a clinically meaningful way, and that will then give you a new way forward. PRISM, though, is really starting from scratch in the sense that there is no treatment for social dysfunction, and actually the understanding of the biology of social dysfunction was very poorly understood. So in parallel with that, I and other uh, companies and organizations are having to work in this sort of middle space as we then build the concepts of precision psychiatry. So we, we need to be in a real world that I, I do want to be positive about it, but I do also need to share the problems that at the moment we're not working in that super precise space. Thank you very much, thanks. I can see a raised hand, and Mario's gone. Where? Okay. Uh, Umar, I think, has got a hand yes. raised. I have, one I have very, okay, one minute. I have a very practical question. Uh, uh, you talk a lot about the the, the qualification uh, of uh, the new tools. How do you? What do you qualify, and how do you qualify? Because if you have various tools like a drug, I can understand how you qualify that. Uh, how do you qualify the digital plus the drug plus uh, all, all the remaining? Right. What, what I'm talking about there uh, in terms of qualifying a tool is that you need to demonstrate to the regulatory authority that the way that you're measuring something is clinically meaningful, is robust, and can be changed in a way that uh, is useful to the patient. So in many ways... A lot of the tools you use to classify your patients at the moment were, in a sense, reverse qualified. So if you think about PANS or Madras, you, you had the neuroleptic or the antidepressant before you had the tool, and you were using the drug in order to prove the tool worked. And that's why I'm saying it then becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy to a certain extent. But that makes it very, very difficult to find a new drug because you're constantly using this tool that you use on your existing pharmacology to define the future. So what we're trying to find is ways that we can break that cycle. So therefore going after something that, that is, is different um, and is measured in a different way. So if you, if you want to look at social dysfunction, if you want to look at impulsivity, you've got to be able to show that first off, you can find patients with that tool that are measurably different from a healthy population or what's deemed to be a healthy population. And then you've got to show the regulators that this is able to measure a, a clinically meaningful and robust change. Only then can I then use that tool in a clinical trial to say that I've now recruited 200 patients, 100 of them have got the problem because the tool measured it, 100 of them don't, therefore my control group, I've now given treatment X, and my disease group or my impaired group have now got better. So there's an awful lot of steps we've got to go through before the regulators will accept that outcome. And if you look at the other areas, um, that's what's, this is where biomarkers and things like this all come in. It's a, it's a complex space, um, but that, that's what we've got to do in the mental health space, in my opinion, is actually come up with better rulers, better measurements, so that we can actually show change and demonstrate change. Does that, help yes yeah. it, it helps so the, the same way uh, like we do with oncology 
surgery or cardiology, but the, the mixing up of different, uh, um, the multimodal point of view that we want to have with digital plus bio plus uh, biomarkers plus drugs uh, is complex for even the, 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 the regulators to understand. It is, and indeed in the mental health space, I really suspect it will not be a single test like what's the level of insulin in the blood or what's the level of corticosterone or the co level of cortisol. I suspect it will be a basket of measures for a particular patient group, and it's us working out what that basket is um, as we move forward together to, to do that. Excellent. Well, I think we have some work to do in the coming years. Uh, we'll fill all these requirements, so we, we're going to be busy. I just want to uh, thank you very, very much. It's been a very exciting talk, and uh, I'm very excited to continue the discussion between Beringer and us. Uh, I, so I suppose everybody can applaud with me. Uh, thank very much, you uh, for his talk. Thank you, Marion. Just, just the question of Umar made me think that it would be nice to to have um, uh, a feedback of those ten years to submit this new endpoint to the regulator. Yeah. This is another discussion, and we don't have. I to know it's another discussion, but to keep just, on. Okay. So just yeah. to remind our colleagues that our next conference, we're going to move again back to the states. And I have asked Andy Miller to describe all the problems we had in clinical trials because we didn't stratify. So basically, what are the lessons learned from all the failures, which probably lead to uh, absence of demonstration of the efficacy of drugs, which might have been efficacy working if we only stratified. So it's another way of looking at this future, which is bright as you just described. So I wish you a very bon après-midi and see you soon. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks a lot.